trying to meet you. Mm. Hey! This is the Stu Street Podcast, episode 25. I'm your host, Sam Mora, and today I'm sitting down with Rob Spivey. Rob is the Director of Research and President of Valens Research, a global equity research firm providing insights to both institutional and retail investors. Prior to joining CEO Joel Littman and developing Valens to where it is now, Rob worked in several financial roles, both on the buy side and sell side, in institutions such as the Abernathy Group, Legacy Capital Management, and Credit Suisse. Rob, thanks for coming on. Sam, thanks, man. It's great to see you again. Yeah, you as well. There's obviously a lot to unpack in your journey, so I'm excited to dive in. But before, I'd like to talk a little bit about your foundational years. So you studied finance actually just down the road here at Northeastern and (laughs) and actually had a minor in philosophy, which I thought was pretty Mm -hmm. fascinating. The first time I actually talked to you, you mentioned that. And um, I'm a little bit interested in understanding how that minor uh, kind of constructed the rest of your college career as well as enriched your approach to problem solving, especially that might differentiate you from your peers at the time and even till now. Uh, first, let me say, don't hold it against you that I'm currently on BU campus as a Northeastern Husky alum. It's fine. I worked um, with all Northeastern this summer, so you know. <laughs> that's right. I did. I made you. That's true. The um, When you look at it, it's funny. When I, was, uh, when I was growing up as a kid, my family always said that I would have made a great lawyer. Um, I chose not to be one, but when you think about the power of philosophy and really actually any of the um, social sciences, but especially philosophy in my view, what it's really all about is about helping you learn how to build an argument, right? So if you think about that same structure, just like being a lawyer, understanding every argument has a beginning, middle and end, but every argument is also just about its weakest point. And that's this thing that philosophy drills into you over and over again. It's, you know, if you go from, you know, anywhere from somebody like Hobbes, who basically did Euclidean algebra, but he actually did Euclidean geometry, but he actually did it um, for philosophy, he would start with these postulates, right? And he would basically go, he'd have to build up from that. And so having, in, in all of philosophy, you know, from logic all the way up to metaphysics is all about that. And when you look at that, it's so powerful because it helps you actually learn how to think and how to build an argument in a way that I think that I often find when people are pitching stock ideas, what you find in, is people will just throw the kitchen sink at an idea, right? Where what they'll do is they'll basically say, oh, you know, and there's this and this and this. And I go, well, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to pick at the weakest point that you have in your argument because your argument is only ever as strong as your weakest point. And I think the big thing that philosophy taught me how to do is to build a coherent, strong, structured argument and also how to write. And that really put me in a kind of a, a step ahead for others when, when I kind of get to the role that I am now. It seems like there's this binary that people have artificially developed between STEM roles and those of the liberal arts. However, I see a lot of parallels, especially in what you talked about between philosophy and say an engineering brain. So where have you seen kind of the synergies there in terms of how you approach um, numeric problems or, or things in the financial world? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great point because when you think about it, it's funny, a really, I, I would assume, um, a really good engineer, and I have many engineers as friends, um, or a really good you know, comp sci programmer, the first thing that you always have to think about is, if you will, the floor of, your, of whatever you're going to design, right? Basically, what is the bedrock of what you're going to design? And then everything is only as strong or as weak as that base of it, right? In terms of your code, how you design for your code to be, your code to be scalable or not scalable, or right, your, your building to be flexible in terms of how you want it. And, and when you look at that, I think there is this very obvious thing when we, a ton of what we do at Valens is all about model building, right? So while we end up analyzing companies and recommending stocks and everything else, the bedrock of everything that we do is really around our models like uniform accounting, right, in terms of how we forecast companies and everything else. And 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 really, when you, when you start thinking about building models in much the same way that philosophy helps you focus on this idea of how do you, how do you actually attack a problem from the base up, um, it really becomes the same thing because all of a sudden what you're focusing on is, okay, I need to build a model and a framework that can work across many industries that isn't just so siloed on one thing that I become either an expert in one thing that I can't live anywhere else or I lose some of that value. And I think if I, if I were to say it, that's probably one way that I think about that, that idea being transferable, if that makes sense. 
you talked a little bit about how your philosophy education transferred over into everything you do, especially with uniform accounting. And there's a lot of aspects of behavioral finance that play into this when you're trying to basically beat the market or figure out where the inefficiencies are. This is something that day one in finance class in school, you're taught, hey, money managers aren't great at this. And if you look at the historical data, there's not many people that can truly beat the market. What provides you with the confidence to be able to still pursue these strategies despite the the statistics that are out there? Despite the overwhelming evidence to yeah. the contrary? Great question. Um, so there's a couple things. Uh, so one is... When you look at the money managers, I think, that have sustainable success over time and those who don't, the ones who do are malleable, meaning they don't have this is the way I do things and this is what it is because those are the money managers that end up basically having an environment where, yeah, you could have five great years of performance because, um, and I think, right, when you had, you had Dave Daglio on this podcast, and I don't know if you talked about the idea of different betas and all that other stuff, but there's an idea in finance, right, we all talk about alpha. But in reality, when we talk about alpha, which is I outperform the market, I cre- I contribute something in terms of my ideas, the reality is a lot of that is just a different form of beta. Beta means I am just capturing a theme or a characteristic, and I am riding that wave. Well, if you're a growth investor, when growth investing works, you're going to crush your benchmark if you're just slightly better than the benchmark. But when growth investing is bad, you're going to you're going you're gonna to sink terribly. If you're a value investor, if you're a um, you know if you're a dividend investor or anything else, and one of the things that I think helps us, or I hope helps us, knock on wood, um, with in terms of being able to you know believe that we can beat the market is our framework and our process and our tools are very malleable, and we really focus on understanding this idea of where it is that we are in the market because different kinds of ideas work in different market characteristics. When you are bottoming in late two th- in early to mid 2009 and the market is bottoming, that is not the time to focus on growth investing, yeah. right? And that's not even the time to focus on traditional value investing. That is a time to focus on distressed, low price to book, right? Deep value ideas because those companies have gotten so beaten up. And just because you're gonna ride the wave of credit refinancing starting to appear, you buy those ideas. And then when you see something going on, this is the idea of our market phase cycle, the macro work that we do that qualifies a lot of what we do in terms of where do we pay attention? Not not how do we do our stock picking, but where do we pay attention to our stock picking um, in terms of understanding the macro cycle, right? When we've got a bullish environment where we've got tons of credit availability that's out there, we've got companies that are starting to invest in growth and everything else. Well, that's the time to don't focus on value companies because value companies are going to massively underperform the market. And so in, in understanding and being able to map that all out, to be able to know where to spend your time and where to allocate then our tools, because this is the next thing that I think is really important, is when you look at investors who, you've got investors who can be great at different parts of the cycle, and then you've got investors who just consistently can't do well. And those are ones that don't have a solid framework and process in general. And one of the things that we have is because we don't try to pretend that we are the smartest people in the room, because we're not, um, I mean, I have a lot of clients that are a lot smarter than I am. Um, what we do, though, is we rely on tools that give us a consistent way of looking at things, right? When you talk about that uniform accounting that we talked about, we talk about our credit work. When you talk about our work on management compensation alignment, our, com- our work on management communication and all those things, all of a sudden it takes all of our trying to be the smartest people in the room out of it and says, hey, I'm relying on a toolbox that leads me to actually be way ahead of anybody else, if that makes sense. Most definitely. And uh, even though I'm privy to it a little bit because I had the chance to work with you this past summer, I want to explain to the listeners a little bit what some of these tools do for you and what some of them are. The first thing is you talked about your market phase cycle, and a lot of this is reliant on credit environment. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit um, from a high level how credit influences equities and how it's largely overlooked both in the academic environment and in the professional investment world? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if, if you look, it's credit doesn't influ- just influence the equity environment. Credit is the lifeblood of, a, of an economy, right? For you to have economic growth, you have to have access to credit. Because if you just think about it in terms of you want to talk about um, you know, how banks lend, how anything else happens, right, in terms of fractional reserves and everything else, it's all about the idea that when you have people borrowing money, you're turning a little bit of money into more money, right? And all that money that people invest with then leads to growth because, right, you spend money to be able to build a factory. 
you building that factory means you're paying somebody else to build a factory. There's a margin embedded in what they're doing, so they're making money, and they get to put more money in the economy. Also, you building that factory lets you make more toys or more tools or more widgets or whatever it is that you're building, which lets you grow the economy, right? The economy grows on credit, and when you actually see credit contract, right, that is when you see a recession. A, re a credit contraction and bankruptcies are not a unwelcome side effect of a recession. They are actually structurally the cause. Um, so when you think about it, this is why when you look over the last 150 years, and if we had good economic data throughout all of history, um, really, especially since the Venetians created banking, but really all the way back until the Babylonians and everything else, um, you know, you look at every single recession and really truly deep market crash also, they're all tied to credit, right? You look at 1906, um, if you're familiar with what happened in the crisis of 1906, literally JP Morgan, the person, not the bank, the person had to lock all of the bankers of Wall Street in a room and say, you're all gonna go under, you need to fix this because you're all about to run out of money. That's what caused everything else to happen. You look obviously at 1929 and 1931, bank runs and everything else. Yeah. You look at um, you know 1949, right? That was driven by credit issues. You look at the 1970s, you look at, um, right? You literally had the highest interest rates ever in the US before the 1980s. That was what caused credit constriction. You had SNL, S, um, SNL loan crisis. You've got um, you know LATAM crisis. Every single one of these crashes, it's all driven by credit. And so if you want to understand where the economy is going and therefore where the market's going, you need to understand credit creation and credit destruction because that's the, if you will, the holy grail that kind of steers everything else. And then what we do is in the market phase cycle, we really break it into kind of those four pieces. If you think that credit environment is like a three to a seven year window, because right, steering the credit ship is like, it's not even like turning a cruise ship. It's like turning, you know, if you will, uh, the three aircraft carriers attached to each other. It's how long it takes for that credit ship to turn. But then underneath that, we then look at the second level, which is saying, okay, now within credit creation, so when you're in a good environment, right, where the credit environment is, is booming, well, then we have to ask the question of, sure, credit's available, but does anybody want it, right? If you think about in 2010, 2011, 2012 even, you know, there was a lot of credit out there, right? We had done TARP to basically bail out all the banks. The banks were lending money. We had taken interest rates all the way down to 0% and everything else, but nobody really wanted to borrow because everybody was licking their wounds, where everybody was just trying to pay off the debt they already had and kind of figure out where is demand coming from. So even with good credit environment, without demand for credit, right, which is really about whether or not people want to invest, you don't go anywhere, right? You kind of see, and that's that idea of, right, we look at value stocks in that kind of environment because the fact that you're not seeing tons of growth everywhere and the market's still kind of waiting and seeing what's going to go on from that economic growth environment. So those value stocks that are really just about multiple expansion of, okay, the world's not going to end, that's a really interesting thing to see. And then when you see growth kick in, when all of a sudden you see companies saying, oh, things are looking good, I want to invest, that's when you get growth stocks. So the second level is kind of growth. And then after that, we look at valuation and sentiment, which are, you know, people spend so much time focusing on valuation. Well, what you really realize at the end of the day is valuation in terms of relative valuation is really relevant, but absolute value is something that people get way too hooked on um, because it has far less impact on the overall market's trend than earnings growth and credit availability do at the end of the day. And in terms of today's environment, we've been hearing for the past year and a half, two years even, recessions in the next six months. And six months go by, no recession. Six months go by, no recession. And <clears throat> recently, we've gotten some, I guess, a little bit of a sigh of relief in terms of core inflation numbers. However, it's still hard to believe that we'll be able to have a soft landing after these record high interest rates. Where do you look when you're trying to corroborate your position or even figure out how things are going to be in terms of going into 2024. Yeah, and I mean, one of the things that we often talk about, and especially the value of having a framework, again, like I talked about before, being able to be a framework investor as opposed to thinking that you're really smart because you never are smarter than the next person, the person next to you, is um, is all of a sudden it, it takes away a lot of the guesswork because you all of a sudden when you have a framework, you can start to say, oh, okay, that's just like this, which has happened these 10 times before, and therefore it's most likely something like this will happen, right? And so we always talk about this idea of history doesn't repeat, but history rhymes frequently. And um, you know, one of the analogies that we make right now is the closest analogy to right now is the late 1940s. Um, in the late 1940s, when you looked at what really happened, because it's a perfect analogy here, right? In 1946, 1945, everybody comes home, right? We've won World War II, right? And so what, what happens though was 
everybody through the 1940s, the early 1940s, GIs were getting paid, right? People were getting paid to make stuff for the war effort um, and everything was going on, but nobody could spend any money, right? And because nobody could spend any money, we saw a massive buildup in savings. And then what happens in 1946, everybody's home and everybody wants to start a family, buy a home, buy a fridge, buy a car. But our industry, right, U.S. industry was built right at that point to make tanks, planes, and ammo. So we saw this surge of inflation, right? We saw inflation go up to 20% for basically a year. Um, and so when you look at when that happens, all of a sudden what happened is the Fed goes from saying, oh, this is a transitory inflation issue just because people want to buy stuff that they can't get to, okay, people are starting to believe that this inflation is structural. And so the Fed then proceeded to massively tighten credit availability, right? Very similar to the Fed going from 0% to 5%, which is what happened in you know 2022, because we had inflation rising because people wanted to buy stuff that they couldn't buy. Everybody in um, 1947, when interest rates start to rise, goes, oh, well, well, at least we're not going to have rampant inflation because inflation came down really, really quickly. Um, however, now the Fed is going to force us into a recession. So the market tanks. But then everybody looks around for a year and a half. And for a year and a half, we don't have a recession. Well, why don't we have a recession? The reason we don't have a recession is the same reason the Fed was raising interest rates in the first place, right? The reason we had inflation was because people had a whole bunch of excess savings that they were using to buy whatever they wanted. Like they were price insensitive as you could be because they're like, I don't care. I've got a whole bunch more money in the savings account. It doesn't matter, which is exactly what was happening through 2022 and 2020, in early part of 2023. We, um, there was a presentation that um, I did a couple times talking about this in 2022, late 2022, and I specifically said in that presentation, um, and we were saying this at Balance repeatedly, is there's not going to be a recession in 2023. And it's not because the fact that there's no issues with credit or anything else. It's the issue is you have to wait. It's a duration issue, right? In terms of when you have tightening credit standards, it's not that credit tightening matters. It's that credit's too high and all of a sudden people need to refinance. That becomes an issue. Well, when everybody had a ton of cash on the sidelines, nobody needs to refinance because you can always pay your debts yeah. with the cash in your savings accounts. We're finally seeing for corporates and consumers that dynamic finally actually go in the other direction, which is why we think, look, we think 2024, we're likely to see a recession. So now, as cash balances are depreciating, but the interest rates are still high, so the cost of borrowing is still there. Exactly. And so what happens is, right, so people can't refinance because nobody wants to give them money because they go, eh, you could afford it at 3% or 2% or 1% or zero for, right, for the Fed funds rate. But when the Fed funds rates at 5%, I've got to add extra money on top of you. And eh, you can't afford that. Um, and so that's what that is what ends up causing a recession. It's when people need to refinance and they can't. Now, what I'll tell you, since I know there's a lot of students listening to this and many of you are probably close to graduation, is you know, a lot of people have only experienced, if you talk about a real recession, 2008. Well, not every recession, or, or even you want to call it 2020, not every recession and every market downturn and every economic downturn is cataclysmic, is possible world ending. There are plenty of run-of-the-mill, general, regular business cycle recessions. 1991 isn't a great example of this. You can even argue 2000 is an example of this. You can argue 1949. They're mild recessions, right? So it's not like, don't think if you've heard horror stories of 2008 in terms of what that means for the job market. It's not that kind of ghost land, but we are likely to see a slowdown. Yeah. And I think that's definitely <clears throat> an important thing to point out. Um, I'm a senior currently, and I see a lot of people, especially in the tech industry, are nervous about what the job outlook is over the next six months. A lot of tech firms even completely put mm -hmm. job applications on pause. So I guess going off of that, what would you say um, if you were in the position of a senior? Um, independent of industry, I guess, as next step efforts given the context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing that you can do is work on your network. Um, you know, I mean, that's where that's how I got where I am today um, was by working on my network. And a lot of working on your network is about understanding investment, right? And investment isn't just spending money. There's a lot of ways that people define wealth. There's a lot of people ways that people define investment, right? You can invest time. You can invest, um, you know, emotionally in something. You can invest in a lot of different ways. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's a lot of times when you think when you're in a job hunt, it everything becomes very me focused. Okay, 
what can I do that immediately can allow me to ask you to do something for me so that I can get what I need, which is a job. And sometimes what you need to do is just understand you are actually investing in a relationship, um, you know, in terms of building that so that when you do finally have to ask something, it's not like this is a blatant transaction, uh, blatant transaction here. This is something that, okay, no, I mean, really, okay, I know you now. You're a person to me and everything else. And I think that's one of the biggest things that you can do in terms of helping to navigate a situation like this and help yourself rise to the top and become somebody that somebody's paying attention to is invest in that relationship with a person, right? And find a way to. Most definitely. <clears throat> and I guess these can come in formal and informal ways. Um, a lot of people, sophomores, juniors, are searching out internship opportunities, and they're in a similar place in terms of there might not be as many internships out there over the next summer. <clears throat> However, at the same time, this is something you can seek out through clubs. It can be through just asking to talk to someone, finding a meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the formal methods, I'd like to talk a little bit about internships as a whole and what they can provide. Um, as I said before, I was able to spend four months with you this summer, which was great. It was a small office where I was able to get a lot of face time with people in important positions where they are making high level decisions and I can get exposure to that. And I think that's a, something that's underappreciated in terms of working for a smaller company or a smaller firm or even team. Um, what has your experience been in terms of working at a bigger company such as Credit Suisse mm -hmm. or a smaller firm? Yeah, and I mean, right, so I worked at Gillette, Lockheed Martin, and Credit Suisse, um, right, all Fortune 100 companies. Well, Credit Suisse used to be. It doesn't even exist anymore. Um, and then um, and then obviously I worked at um, Legacy and I worked at the Abernathy Group before we founded Balance. Um, the cool thing that I will say, not to not to just talk up um, small businesses, but the really important thing in any role that you get um, is that you make sure that you find a boss and a culture around you that wants to invest in you, um, that actually wants to have an open door for you, that wants you to be able to learn from them. And you can find that in a large organization uh, where where you can actually find if you if you land in the right place. And this is the important thing. A lot of people think. I just need to have the you know the name the the name to be able to say look on my resume you can see I, I did Goldman Sachs or I did Credit Suisse or I did X Y Z um, and that that's all that's the value but the actual value that you get from being in those places isn't the brand name it's the opportunity if you find the right group to be able to be exposed to really smart people who want to invest in you and teach you and I do think though that the nice thing is in a small organization um, it's easier to find that or find out if you're not going to get that a lot faster. Um, and the cool thing about a small organization is you do, to your point, like you got the exposure at Valance, you do get to see, you know, quite frankly, one, how the sausages are made, but two, you get to actually see how your work can impact something a lot faster, um, which is really can just be a lot very fulfilling for people. It was always fulfilling for me. Like the reason why I left Credit Suisse, um, because the fact that um, I, I did have the opportunity to stay, but I looked and I said, I don't know that I'm ever going to see me versus the next person who walks in the door is going to actually impact Credit Suisse in the next 10 years, um, right? That I'm going to be able to move the needle. And when I went to Legacy and then I went to the Abernathy Group, for both of those places, I could directly see that, no, the stocks I was picking, the ways that I was changing our investment framework, the research I was doing directly ended up impacting our clients. And because of that, I got direct feedback from our clients and from my bosses too, because my stuff mattered in a way that it didn't necessarily at Credit Suisse all the time. Um, and so that was really valuable to me, right? That ability to be able to say, hey, I'm going to be able to see how my stuff directly impacts the company. And that means I'm also going to see the senior people actually give me more directed feedback. And that's how when right, Joel and I founded Valance, that's what we've always committed to ever since then, because I just think it's it's a bedrock to, right, if you invest in somebody, then you're going to get a lot back from them. By the way, just really quick before you go, um, the one thing I wanted to say um, about the informal and formal things, people often think, right, that the only option is something like an internship or anything else, but I love that you bring up the idea of just asking somebody for a conversation. The frequency with which, right, as a Northeastern alum, I, I get people ping me to say, hey, can we have coffee or something? And it's I'm not going to have a job for all of them, but I'm going to sit down with as many as I can for coffee to be able to be like, hey, what's going on in your career? What is it? What are the questions that you have for me or anything else? How can I help? 
people love to be needed. And this is another thing to, imp- to remember in a job search or in networking. Um, people like to be wanted and needed. And so when you're asking somebody for advice, don't think you're wasting their time. If you're wasting their time, they just won't take the meeting. Um, but if you're not, and most people won't feel like you are, they'll feel like they're helping you. And they love that. People love that. So just remember that. Sorry, I didn't mean to take you off that point. But No, most definitely. It's a, it's a great point to make. And I think that kind of ties back to some of the things you were saying before, where you were able to find those groups of people within organizations, whether it's big or small, who want to be that source of information for you and have been within a company for a while, maybe when you're entry level. And um, so don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, Going off of your point right before that about when you joined with Joel and really delved into the work that you're currently doing, can you talk a little bit about how that relationship was formed and what the original vision was? Yeah, I mean, so Joel was my boss's boss at Credit Suisse. Um, so the way that I, and this comes to the idea of, right, a lot of these things are about building a network. I would have, without the co-op program at Northeastern, I would never be where I am today um, because of the fact that it, one, it gave me the ability to know when I worked at Gillette that I never wanted to do industrial accounting, which is where I thought I was going to go for my career. And two, it met, allowed me to meet Joel and countless other people who helped build my career once I came out of, um, once I came out of, of college. Um, but yeah, so Joel was my boss's boss at Credit Suisse. Um, and then from there, um, you know, and this comes to the idea of, right, give and take and everything else. When my co-op was wrapping up, I said to Joel, um, actually, Joel said to me, he said, so what do you want to do with your life? And I said, well, you know, as fun as Credit Suisse was, I would really love to go to the buy side, right? So right, Credit Suisse sell side, they sell research, they sell investment banking and everything else. And then you get the buy side, those are people who actually run money, right? When you hear about hedge funds, mutual funds, wealth advisors, right, that side of things. So it's like, I want to go to the buy side. I want to be able to make sure that my I can put points on the board, right? That my decisions matter. Um, and so he actually synced me up with one of his clients. Um, and that's where I got my first job in terms of my, my, my last co-op was at Legacy Capital Management, which was in wealth advisory. And then after that role, I actually went back to him and a couple other people who I had relationships with and said, hey, I love that. I'd like to do something similar. Um, and fortunately enough, he had another client in um, uh, called the Abernathy Group in New York, which was a small hedge fund, one of the most successful hedge funds of the 80s and 90s, et cetera. And um, actually was able to introduce me and walk me in. Um, and I got a job there as an analyst. Um, and so, and ironically enough, I was his client, right? I was literally Joe's client. And then um, I got to a point though, after a few years where I said, you know, um, I've learned a lot here. I think that um, I'd love to take the next stage of learning by going elsewhere. Um, and I said to him and this other guy, Al Jackson, and a few other people who were in my network, I said, hey, I'm about to go interview with a bunch of places. But before I do, is there anyone who you actually think I should interview with? Right. Again, give and take, right? Saying, hey, is there any place that you think makes sense? And Joel actually goes to me, and goes, actually, you want to come build a company with me? Um, and that's where it all came from, right? It all, and because basically what happened was I never thought I'd cross back over to the sell side from the buy side, because right, at Fallon's Research, we do sell investment research. We don't run money. Um, but all of it was, the thing that was compelling to me was, was this idea of what I talked about at the beginning. When Joel laid out what he was thinking about, it was a systems-based approach of investing that I said, oh, this is scalable. This is systematic. This is actually something that I don't think that I'm just another guy who's trying to be really, really smart. And there's a whole lot of those on the street. Um, and so that's how we ended up where we were. It seems like that authentic connection and not just asking, hey, give me a job, that sort of thing that a lot of people prompt in cold emails Mm -hmm. later on benefited you in a way that you might not have saw coming. Um, So that's very refreshing to hear as well. Since the origins of Allen's, you and Joel have established several research lines with over 170,000 clients reading your daily articles. Um, every month and over half of the 300 largest institutional investors subscribing your stock recommendation list. As we talked about, he asked you, hey, come build this company with me. What does that look like in terms of now reaching that scale? How did you get from point A to point B? I guess that's a, that's a big question. There's a lot of moving parts to it, but can you simplify that down for us a little bit? First, thank you for the advertisement. Um, the uh, and um, and yes, you already know I'm a talker, so I can fill up a lot of space with this. <laughs> uh, but it's it's actually interesting. I was um, I was recently uh, speaking to an offsite for um, a uh, for a small investment bank, and I actually got a very very similar question, which was you know. 
when you think about for traditional investment banking, and I'm going to get to your answer, and I'm uh, to answer the question in a moment. But when you think about traditional investment banking, it's all about transactions. It's not a scalable business, right? It's okay. We've got consumer products company X Y Z who wants to be taken public. Okay, we got to run really sprint and do all the work that we can for them, and then okay, the transaction happens or it doesn't. We get paid or we don't, and then we got to go do another thing. There's nothing I can take from that and basically make scalable, um, and it kind of helps to see the journey of Valens and how we made Valens scalable. Because when we started Valens, um, we started literally the first name for Valens research was equity analysis and strategy. Um, and the reason why was because we thought what was going to happen is we were going to build a cool little research shop based on our tools. And then um, we were going to have a broker dealer buy us and lock us in as basically their scalable way of being able to provide research uh, you know, at a low cost and a scalable way. Um, well, that didn't work um, because the fact that the brokerage model was being totally disrupted and everything else. Um, and so then we had to basically look around and say, okay, so this idea of doing um, bespoke research for clients who each individual hedge fund calls us up and asks us for something, yeah, it's all well and good, but this clearly isn't going to be something that's scalable because we can't find a partner to help bring us there. So then we went to the next side of what we basically did. We said, okay, so let's think about what's worked in Wall Street for, for, for whatever, for forever, I should say. Um, and that's right, just publishing systematic, re publishing research, right? Instead of saying, hey, what do you, Sam, at Hedge Fund XYZ? What do you, you know, Sam at, um, uh, at SAC Capital or Point72? What do you want? And we'll do it. We now say, well, we cover these 30 names um, on the credit side and the equity side, and we're going to publish those. And then we're going to have subscribers who just buy because they want to research. And then we built a good little business on that that was on top of the bespoke business that we had. But still, we we're like, okay, clearly, we're struggling for, um, you know, basically to find a distribution partner for this. And, you know, even with our systematic approach, right, we can't hit what everybody wants and cares about. So we looked around and we said, okay, what do we need to do to pivot again? Right. How do we, if we want to continue to scale this business and turn this business into something bigger, what do we need to do? And then we said, well, you know, we've got all these tools um, that we use internally for our research. Let's build a version of these tools that somebody else can buy. So they don't even need to actually have us do any work. Now we're really scalable because of the fact that we're basically saying, hey, you want to look at our uniform accounting data for Boeing and Deer and Caterpillar all in 30 seconds? Well, we're not going to be able to do that for you, but we can build the tool to let you do that. You want to look at our earnings call forensics work that's identifying whether or not we're seeing confidence or deception from management? Well, now you can access that for any company that you want to access it for. And all of a sudden, what that did is it took us to the scalable business. But each of these things, um, you know, and now we're at a point where, as you know, because you were involved in some of the early stuff that we were looking at for leveraging AI to write some of our content and everything else, and we've used AI to build several tools around competitive advantage and everything else. All this stuff was about basically saying, right, each time we built a little business that didn't really get as big as we hoped it would. So we said, how do we have to evolve? Because you never go, the first shot never works, yeah. um, right? It never does. Any entrepreneur will tell you this. You always have to be comfortable pivoting. And that's what we had to do. And it was basically constantly just trying to evolve to be able to get the biggest TAM possible and make it as easy for them to get it. It seems like the benchmark that you built everything else off of, though, is centralized around those tools, those proprietary assets you have. <clears throat> we talked a little bit about some of the things Valens does already. But one of the main things I want to dive deeper into is uniform accounting. Mm -hmm. um, the term's been tossed around a few times already in this interview, but we haven't really discussed what that means and how that makes you different than the rest. Yeah. I mean, when you talk to any CFO or any analyst worth their salt, what they'll all tell you is accounting is really a compliance exercise, right? When you actually look at how we do accounting in terms of any company who has to file, um, it's all based on these rules that are really just meant to make sure that the disclosure happens, right? That you basically, all the numbers that you need are there, but it actually has no representation of what real economic profitability is for a business. When you look at, if you want to understand, you know, how profitable Berkshire Hathaway is, right? Listen to Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett will tell you, you can't trust my gap earnings. My gap earnings are, gar are garbage. They'll go up $50 billion one quarter and they'll go down $50 billion the next quarter. That has nothing to do with the stability of my business. My business is remarkably stable. And because of that, right, these are the things that we run into. So what we actually did was we went through the process of basically saying, what are the 130 different adjustments that we need to make to Azure Porter accounting, to the stuff that comes out of 10Ks and 10Qs that our company files publicly, um, and say, to get to close to economic reality, to get to if we were going to be analyzing our own business, how would we actually look at it, right? What are the ways that we would look at the numbers to say, right, when you think about some of the 
you know, greatest analyst teams in the world, how do they do things, right? How do they look at things? When we look at, listen to guys like Warren Buffett, listen to guys like Ben Graham, right? Listen to guys like Seth Klarman. How do they think about businesses? And then how do we actually make sure that the accounting reflects that? That's what uniform accounting is all about. And so what we've done, right, is, and this is one of the, the bedrock of everything that we do, is we've done that systematically, leveraging our team in the Philippines and our team in Turkey to be able to, and the systems that they've helped us build, to be able to do that for 25,000 companies globally for the last 20 years. And this is one of the things, as you talked about, you looked at how does Wall Street structure things. Also, how can we use a framework over there, but do things in a different manner, um, eventually allowing you to scale. Wall Street analysts hardly ever put sell recommendations. Mm -hmm. And this is in benefit of their other arms of their business. They don't want to lose clientele. However, being an independent organization as you are, you have the liberty to accurately reflect the business's health as well as give a proper recommendation, which is the whole bedrock of your credibility. What would you say in terms of garnering that credibility level and gaining that trust over your clientele? Does it fully happen through just showing results in terms of returns or transparency? How do you how do you balance that? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. Um, you know, when you think about it in terms of the it's it's Wall Street. So still at the end of the day, if your if your results don't show it, nobody really cares. Um, you know, it's so funny. There's all this idea of, um, you know, there's a uh, good outcome, bad process, good outcome, good process, good process, bad outcome, all this other stuff. Um, Wall Street and investors so tend to focus on the idea of outcomes when process is so much more important. What you end up have, what we end up have happening, and which has been great for us, is, um, you know, if you have a sound process in the right way of looking at things, you'll have true believers. Um, who will stick with you, um, who will understand it. But the reality is it's only if your you know, authentic process actually produces results that it matters. And so a lot of the reasons why you know, we've built the, the huge uh, individual investor business that we've built, right, and we've been able to get the clients that we have from an institutional investor perspective, the reason why we've been able to do that is because the results follow through from right, what the actual process does, which I mean, at the end of the day, people are only gonna be so patient if that's not the case. And your process also kind of involves a global network at this point. And that's been a big tradition or transition, sorry, for a lot of companies since COVID occurred. However, was this part of your strategy from the get-go or when did globalization come into play for a firm that's largely recommending based on the U.S. market? Yeah, I mean, we've, from the beginning of Valance, we have been international in scope. So our first, so I was... I and Joel and two other colleagues in the U.S. were, you might say, our first employees, but actually our first employees were in the Philippines. Um, and so we've had, so we have a team of 150 now, of which 100 are in the Philippines, 25 to 30 or so are in Turkey, and the rest are here. Um, but in terms of the idea of, you know, we always structured our business that way because we said, look, let's make sure that the people who can do things the best, the most efficient, not just from a cost perspective, but also from a, you know, from an execution perspective are the place that we want to go to. Um, and then in terms of, you know, when you look at, um, you know, the one thing that I'd say, we already as an organization, it wasn't just that we were global in scope. We had a plenty of people who were um, always not working directly in an office. And so we had always been dealing with the idea of how do we make sure that we have communication and we have cohesion in a non, you know, in-person environment. Like, for instance, our development team, who's 12 people, they maybe all get together three times a year. Um, other than that, they all work from home, right? And um, even our accounting team, um, our, our accounting analyst team, not accounting, like basically building our books, but the ones who deal with everything that we do from uniform accounting perspective, a huge chunk of them are strewn across the Philippines. Um, and then even here in the States, you know, for forever, at least half of our employees have been, you know, spread out. So I will say COVID was a bit easier for us because the fact that we already had that. That being said, the one thing that it did help highlight for us that I think is actually a good thing is it is very easy. And this is the this is the double edged sword of um, of remote work. Um, it made it far more obvious to us what our employees that had been remote were actually missing out on that we had never realized before. Because what was really interesting that happened was right, we had built structures to make sure that we had communication and we had everything that we needed for people to execute for forever. 
But all of a sudden, when everybody was remote, you noticed the fact that, oh, I used to talk to so-and-so all the time in the office. Um, and now the act of, so like Aaron, right, who you know Aaron. Uh, Aaron would just po- would just bother me whenever he needed to have a question in the office. And I'm like, yeah, what's going on? And now I was getting to a point where like, I might not talk to Aaron for two days. And the reason why was because he's like, well, I don't know if Rob's busy on calls because I can't see him. Yeah. Um, and so I'm afraid to ping him and bother him. And so thinking about building that structure and um you know we've we've kept our organization since as many people are trying to push people to come back fully and everything else we've kept our structure as hybrid since but what i'll tell anybody starting a career is if you aren't in the office and this is something like i said i didn't really fully grasp until we went remote in 20 and 2021 if you're not in the office, there are tremendous things. If you're never in the office, there are tremendous things that you miss out on in terms of building those relationships that we talked about that help your career. You, It's really a lot harder to build those relationships if you're never going to the office. And it's also really harder to learn through inertia, learn through osmosis, I should say, not inertia, learn through osmosis of just listening to the conversations that your colleagues have if you're never in the office, um, which is something that I, I realize now and I actually care about for our our co-ops and for our junior employees, not because the fact that I'm worried they're not going to do their work. I know they do their work because they crush it. It's more about I care about investing in them in the future. And if they're not in there, they're not going to get that investment. I think <clears throat> another kind of sub point that is drawn out of what you're saying is the hybrid approach that you have might not work for all organizations, but I think it's highly dependent on the culture you've developed because just from my stint within Valens, there was an open door policy that you had where at any point I could ask you a question and it expedited my learning process tenfold. And as you talked about there, that was somewhat lost when you and Aaron were separated in terms of distance rather than being in the office and you can contextualize when people are busy. Mm -hmm. However, at the same time, uh, developing a culture where you can still communicate offline is great. I worked with people in Istanbul every day when I worked with you, and it was very much like they were in the office in the way in which we could communicate um, and having different mediums over Zoom, over Gchat, whatever it might be. So my question is, where did you develop this leadership strategy, or did it feel just like the natural way the company organically built? Um, Was it a mentor you had early on where this seemed like the avenue to go because not a lot of executives operate in that manner. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that when you look at how Joel and I have tried to build a business, I think that we, both of us have always been mindful of the idea of saying, what would, what would we want? And if we want to have long-term viability for the business and for the business to grow, we understand that that investment is the bedrock of how our business can grow. Um, I actually don't know um, where it came from. If if I had to, if I had to wager, you know, some of it certainly came from, you know, I mean, when I look at um, one of my, one of the people who I've always looked up for from a business perspective, genuinely, this is a cheesy thing to say, but it's my mother. Um, she rose to the ranks of um, Lockheed Martin G and Lockheed Martin. And a lot of the, the ways that she did was by being a um, an intelligent investor in others, in a leader. Um, and always basically saying, I'm going to make time for others because that'll pay off for me. And I think that I just internalized some of that. Um, But it just truly what I always give the advice of um, my employees, um, especially so, you know, um, because you were um, in our organization, right? So big chunk of our staff in the U.S. right, are co-ops. And for those of you who don't know, because you're not fortunate enough to have co-ops at BU, (laughs) again, won't hold it against you. is um, the co-op program basically, right? You work for six months, you go, you, then you go to school for six months. Um, and so a lot of our employees that come through our office, we're not going to hire full time, right? Just because we can't hire that many people. Um, and it just doesn't yeah. make sense for us to. Um, and so what I always tell them and give them advice is, is look, you should always feel comfortable asking your boss um, any question that is going to help you do a better job at the business. Because the fact that that's going to benefit them. And if you have a boss who doesn't want to make time to answer those questions, you need to ask yourself the follow-on question, which is, okay, is this an organization that I want to invest in long-term myself? Because this is an organization that's going to get me somewhere. And that's why it's so important, you know, when you think about your career, um, thinking about those things early on in your career and making sure that you are building that network and that you are finding 
leaders um, and colleagues who will invest in you is so important. Speaking of investing in your employees, both Joel and yourself had made <coughs> significant efforts to promote physical and mental well-being for your employees, including stressing the importance of eight hours of sleep. I know this is something Joel said on a, a weekly about. basis. And even bringing in speakers such as licensed doctors and nutritionists to give seminars on how to get the most out of your mind and body. The importance stressed on these facets of life is often too forgotten in the workplace, especially in the financial services industry. So how has this perspective varied from what you've seen throughout your career? And why is it a, such an inherent part of the company at this point? I, I got to give a whole lot of credit for Joel to, to Joel for this one, because this is really, you know, he's always had this philosophy that I, I completely agree with having learned and listened to him and thought about it. Right. Um, and everything else, which is this idea that health is the first wealth. Right. So you can be when you look at, you know, there's so many people in this world who have done tremendously well and everything else. But, you know, they've treated their body like garbage and, you know, they get to the point where they're 50 and they can't even do the things that they'd want to be able to do with all the wealth they built. And so if you don't make sure to take care of yourself, you'll never be able to enjoy all the things that you're doing all of this work to get to get part of. Because what, two, the two things that we always talk about, one is the idea of, right, health is the first wealth. And that's why, you know, I often say this when somebody is unwanted, I go, just, just work can wait, always take care of yourself. Um, but the other thing is the idea of, you know, we also get this idea of when we're at work, where our only focus should be work. When we're at home, our focus shouldn't be work. It should be being at home. Well, because there's this idea of this work-life balance, right? And the idea of a work-life balance is just actually a really stupid thing because it's not like you're not alive when you're at work, yeah. right? It's work-life and non-work-life balance. And I think that some of the, that, that framework of work-life balance gets people out of sync in terms of thinking about, okay, how do I take care of myself and my health and everything else? Um, where talking about both of them are part of life, which means all the important things about life you need to think about when you're at work, not just when you're not at work. I don't know if that answers the question. But. It most definitely does. And do you think this has orchestrated less employee burnout and turnover? I hope. Um, you know, I've never done analysis on it systematically. I guess what I would say is even if it hasn't, I hope that it's actually caused people who have worked for us to think better about how they live their lives in general. So if it benefits the company, and I hope it does, that's great. But for me, it's always been more about making sure that you know our people are in the right place. Uh, I completely agree. And one of the, the things, at least I, I can give you from an employee perspective, was hearing you and Joel say that from week one. Not only was it nice to see the investment in the employee in terms of their health and thinking, OK, that's a prioritization. But it clearly showed a level of transparency between upper level management and the whole employee base that then liberated me as well as the other interns to feel like we could ask questions because they were respected and because you knew you were going to garner an actual answer from them. So I think it, it has kind of a dual benefit there. Thanks. Man. I appreciate it. Um, Pivoting a little bit, we talked about artificial intelligence and how you're implementing a few tools within the company. This is a largely debated topic right now. We saw the drama that went on last weekend with OpenAI, and we're just seeing where it'll play out in terms of the future of artificial intelligence. But nonetheless, it is an inevitable part of the future of human workflow. So where do you see AI being utilized in the investment world as a tool for good? Can I first say, can we just agree that clearly what happened was they realized that they had created Skynet and they freaked out and that's why they fired Sam Altman? Um, if you, but I mean, if you think about AI in terms of where is it going to take work, um, right, which is the question. Um, uh, you know, it's funny. I was at a, um, I was at a conference was it earlier this year. Or I think it was earlier this year. And this, uh, this guy was talking about the idea of this convergence of all these different technologies and how it's the first time that we've ever had this convergence of these seven technologies and everything else. You know, it was about um, healthcare and biotech, AI, um, EVs and batteries, et cetera, et cetera. And, it's like, and this is going to, you know, create an a innovation burst that we've never seen before in the world. And I kind of just sat there and I was like, well, I feel like if you had been the age that you are now in 1991, you would have said the exact same thing about the internet. And it didn't end the world. It just allowed us to do a whole lot more. 
And I think that there's a lot of perception of fear about what AI is going to do to, you know, take away jobs or do something else. And I think that that's kind of missing the boat um, because I think what AI is going to allow us to do, it's going to allow people to do a lot more. Just like how if I if I think about in if I had to do my job today in 1980, how long it would take me to analyze a single company. Right to do uniform accounting on a single company because I would have a literal spreadsheet paper because I don't know many people don't know this um, but right the reason why it's called spreadsheets in terms of Excel or anything else is because we used to have paper that looks just like it and you used to actually literally have to write out and do the math on that piece of paper and so when I think about what that went until late in the 1980s when we were building models and everything else and all of a sudden wow we could analyze all these companies and right the market started to get more efficient well that didn't nobody lost their job because of that. Right. What happened was it actually let more people be able to be in the world of finance because it it actually leveled the playing field and it actually expanded the playing field. And then if you look at the Internet, right, and what the Internet actually did, the Internet did the same thing. It leveled and expanded the playing field. It actually let more people be able to get in to the environment as opposed to pushing people away and saying, no, nobody has to do this job. And so I think that AI is going to do a lot of the same things um, where I think that people are afraid of AI, but what it's actually probably going to do is open the opportunity for a lot more people to do um, really interesting work and also create new jobs for people. So, I mean, to answer the question in terms of in, in vague generalities and platitudes, which is what I just did, but to answer in spe specificity, you look at what we're doing right now in terms of competitive advantage work, right, which is one of the ways that we've been leveraging AI. Um, when you analyze a company, right, any company, the first question as we try as we taught you is not like what does it do in terms of what is the gadget it makes or what's the service provided, it's how does it make money, which is not that, right? What the way a company makes money is what is the thing that makes you buy from them, right? So if you talk about Apple, right, what is the thing that makes you buy from Apple? It used to be a network effect, um, right, where it's like, oh, everybody else is using Apple, I have to. Now Apple's competitive advantage is switching costs. Because once you're on iPhone and your MacBook and your iPad and everything else, the thought of having to transition that onto Android will give you hives, right? You just There's no way that you're ever going to do it. And because of that, you will keep on buying iPhones no matter what Apple charges for them. Maybe you'll buy one generation back or something, but you will keep on buying iPhones. And so... To be able to to be able to figure out competitive advantages for companies is historically a time consuming thing because you really have to think about okay how does this company make money let's read all the filings and everything else, and so what we did is we trained the chain trained this tool, this AI this machine learning tool to basically say okay we're going to tell you for these hundred companies what their competitive advantages are. We want you to go read their 10Ks and their 10Qs and their annual proxies and all of the other stuff that they talk about themselves on the web and understand what are, this, what are the patterns for the companies that have each of these different competitive advantages. Now we want you to go look at another 100 companies and do the exact same thing. And then we're going to tell you whether or not you did it right or not. And then we're going to do that again and again and again until we got to the point where AI was 99 times out of 100 saying the same competitive advantage that we would say, who've spent years thinking about this so, issue. So in this way, you're using supervised learning from the analysis you've already done? Exactly. Right. And all of a sudden, what that lets us do, though, is now when we analyze a company, we don't have to spend all that time doing that part of the analysis, right? Because we don't have to spend the time figuring out the competitive advantage. We just basically go, okay, this is a competitive advantage. Now, here are the 10 questions I need to know about this company to know whether or not it's going to lose that competitive advantage. Analysts, go focus on that. Which means now those analysts, our analyst team, can analyze 10 times more companies than they yeah. could have when they had to spend all the time. And I think that that's the thing that's going to happen. It's about get, allowing people to do a lot more. And quite frankly, unless you're obsessed and love doing busy work, which I assume most people don't love to do, um, it's going to be better for you, not worse. I think a lot of the fear stems from those unknowns. And it's since it's a novel industry, people are still trying to figure out its use purposes. And for that reason, they're scared about their employment, especially during our current economic mm -hmm. time. As you talked about with the internet, a similar thing happened. There's actually a famous video of Bill Gates on The Tonight Show trying to explain what the internet was and people getting freaked out almost immediately. Mm -hmm. Now it's part of just daily routine. First thing you do when you wake up in the morning, oh, let me check what is it, Yahoo Finance or whatever you're doing on your phone. How can we, I guess, this is a, a broad question, but how can we as a society reduce the 
a learning curve for the average person to be able to understand these technologies in a more beneficial light. When I came at when I was saying this thing that I was saying about 1980 and 1991 or 1999 or whenever you want to draw the line on those things or et cetera, I think the the more important thing is than trying to accelerate people, um, I think, and this is you know it's it's funny it's something that um, I've learned as we've built our business and not because I've learned it but because people have told me it so many times that it finally actually sunk in, um, which is the idea of you always need to meet people where they are. Um, right. It's, and and this, is, this is so important in sales, right? In sales, you have to have this idea of you're not going to convince somebody to buy a new car if they don't think they need a car. What you want to find is somebody who wants to buy a car and then you need to convince them that you want to buy that car. Um, and why that's relevant here is if you think in any in any technology, you have a technology adoption cycle, right? Well, you've got early adopters and, ado- and um, you know, basically innovators and early adopters. And then you've got this chasm which is where basically no everybody doesn't know how to use it. And so this idea, I forget the name of the business professor, um, very, very bright guy. I've read the book um, and learned a lot and then forgot the name. Um, <laughs> this idea of crossing the chasm, right? And so there's this point where basically what happens is between where the early adopters finish and you know, broad population has, where everybody kind of looks and doesn't know what to do with it. Well, you can't... It, you can't really close that chasm magically, right? You just kind of have to embrace that it's going to happen. But then what you have to do is be thinking about preparing yourself for how you can help once you get finally the broader population to do it, how you can get them there. Um, so I don't know if it's accelerating them, but it just how do you prepare the same way that you have time and time again, which I think just bringing it to where they are. Meaning it's less about showing them all these cool new fangled ways that they could use AI to do things, but it's more saying you're trying to do this, here's the AI that can do it for you, right? Which is, I think, so many people don't realize that's literally what your what your phone does for you every yeah. single day, um, but that's another point. And I know even with myself, I most of the time now go to GPT-4 instead of traditional search, and that was a process that over the span of three weeks, I didn't recognize I was even doing until I was like, wow, I haven't Googled in a while. And then I went to do it. I'm like, this isn't giving me results I want at all, even though the algorithm's been fine-tuned every single search with billions of people. Yep. Um, and so it is fascinating how those processes just kind of occur on their own without you noticing. Um, <clears throat> I guess yet again, to, to kind of push things forward, I just want to hear a little bit more advice for young professionals and investors in the space. Um, so for students entering the workforce, as we talked about before, there's this balance between being a generalist and a specialist. And when you're early on in your career, especially in college, you take a broad array of classes, even if you're focusing on a specific major, to kind of get your feet wet in different topics. However, when you enter your first job, you might be hyper-focused on one or two projects for the span of a year and a half. How would you approach as a young person coming out of school or even if they didn't go to college but come out of high school and try to enter the workforce, balancing between being a generalist and a specialist? What's the avenue you would take? Yeah, I mean, there's the there's the, av- <clears throat> the avenue that I actually did take. And then there's the, if you think, <clears throat> I'm going to answer this, I'll answer what I did and what I would prefer if I were to do it again. Second, what I'll tell you is, um, first is the fastest way if you're looking to do the traditional path in career is you specialize, specialize, specialize first, because that's the fastest way to accelerate in a career. Um, but I actually chose to go the other direction consciously. Um, I've always actually been a generalist. Um, ever since I was at Credit Suisse, I was a generalist. When I was at the Abernathy Group, I we were I was so generalist that I literally in the middle of 2008 went from being an equity analyst to a credit analyst for a few months because the fact that's where the opportunity was, so that's where we went. Um, and and I think that it, it the reason why I would recommend the idea of thinking about being a generalist if you can comes the idea of if I think about the idea of being long term greedy. Um, and right, greedy isn't being greedy isn't a bad thing or a good thing. By the way, greedy is just you know a thing. Um, but the idea of being long term greedy it's something that right they always you you'll hear that phrase. It's actually a phrase that is said a lot in Goldman. It's the idea of saying, well, no, let's not try to win every single transaction. 
Instead, let's try to make sure that we are actually being a good partner because if we are, we'll get more revenue overall because the fact that we are being long-term greedy, right? Let's not look at trying to win every single thing. Same idea in terms of being long-term greedy with your career. Yes, you will get to the you will get to the opportunity that you think you want right now faster if you specialize because once you specialize, if you're the only person who can do something, people will always be chasing you. But the issue is, if you think about where you want to be in your career in 20 years, is that necessarily what you're going to want to do? Um, and if you specialize so much so quickly, you end up actually becomes really hard to right, get out of your lane. One of the things that I was I was taught, um, Joel was actually because right again he was a mentor before he was my business partner. Joel said this to me once or twice, and actually I've heard this from other people too, which is the idea of every single career decision you make. Um, especially in your 20s, should not be about how much money you make in the next year or in the next five years. It should be, where do I want to be when I'm 40? Because if you think about everything as where you're going to be when you're 40, you will be making the right long-term goal life decisions for yourself because the fact that the vast majority of money that you make in your career is between the ages of 40 and 55. Right? That is where, if you want to talk about how do you build wealth, and even wealth, not just wealth in terms of money wealth, wealth in terms of how are you would define wealth, do you find define wealth in terms of ability to spend time with your family? Do you find wealth in terms of your ability to travel? Do you find wealth in terms of how much money you make? Whatever it is, the place where you can actually have a fulcrum for that and where you can actually start to impact that is when you get into your 40s and 50s. And so if you think about where you think you want to be, and as we talked about before, twists and turns for Valens and certainly the twists and turns that I took in my career, um, it's not you're not going to be right in terms of where you want it to be. But if you think about that, that always being your load, your lodestar and, instead of how can I you know, basically chase the fastest money, um, it'll pay dividends for you. And the fastest way and the best way to do that is be a generalist, right? Because if you are a generalist, you're exposed to so many things that effectively – if you're good at your job and you're a generalist, you keep your options open for as long as you possibly can in terms of learning as much as you can and also learning things that are interdisciplinary, right? Yeah. So fast, which is so important that I just think if you specialize, well, it is the fastest career path. It's oftentimes not the one that benefits you longer term. Do you believe that helped you make the transition to the buy side? Oh, definitely. Yeah, 100%. I mean, the um, so there's a classic path to the buy side, which is, you work in investment banking or consulting for two to three years, and then you go right. You go to business school, and then you go from that to right to the buy side. And the reason why is because the buy side that's hiring you there is hiring you because you have incredibly deep relationships that you've built in this one industry that you're then going to be an industry analyst, and you're going to live in the part the world of auto parts for the rest of your life. Um, or, but right, the path that I took right to your point in terms of being a generalist. The skills that that let me have was whenever I was talking to anybody for talking to a fund. I could always basically talk to whatever their wavelength was as opposed to trying to fit them to talk in my language, um, which became very, very powerful for having those conversations. I'm actually glad you brought that up because it's something I wanted to touch on earlier. Um, and actually the first guest on our show ever, um, Gordon Gilks, who's the president of Dance Sport Confidence in Sydney, Australia, stressed the importance of learning how other people take in information and speaking in their language. So this can be in the ways they learn things, whether they're a visual learner or need to hear things spelled out in a certain way. And you do this on almost a daily basis in terms of handling different pools of investors. You speak to retail investors, institutional investors, different client pools overall. So how do you cater those, um, I guess, information dumps on these different groups of people to the ways in which they ingest information? Yeah, I mean, again, it comes to the idea of meeting people where they are. Um, and this is, it's the funny, the, the people who most often beat this into my brain is so in the individual investor side of our business, right? So the primary way that me may, that we basically get people to understand that they want to buy our stuff is we create these, you know, larger events that we say, hey, look, this is something that's going on that's very important. We want you to listen. People listen. They go, oh, that's interesting. I want to learn more. I want to buy your product so I can learn more. Um, and it's often that we'll be pitching to the copywriters, the people who to basically draft that. And we'll say, we have this idea and this idea and this idea. And they go, yeah, that's really interesting. However, um, you think that because you literally live in this universe every single hour of every single day of your life, the person who's your buyer, they're going to be thinking about that in nine months. So you trying to sell it to them right now isn't going to work. So don't. Just stop. Um, and really, we've internalized that over the years. And the idea of 
it is important to listen to your customer. And when I say listen to your customer, this is important. Your boss is your customer, right? You're, it's not just the person who ends up buying your stuff. The person who pays your salary is your customer. And so when you want to figure out how to communicate to your boss, you need to listen to how they respond to communication. And that's the same thing. And so we've so we think about this and we've learned the idea that, look, individual investors, they want to be taught. Um, right, at least our clients do. I shouldn't say all individual investors, but our clients, they want to be taught. They want you to tell them something interesting to learn everything else. So we actually pivot all of our content to teach. Well, our institutional investors, they go literally, you can ask, I'm sure Dave mentioned this, every single one of my clients always says this on the institute side, I get a thousand emails of research every single day. Um, so I don't need you to explain to me the, the boring minutia of how Google works. I've got a guy who can do that for me. I just need you to tell me the one piece of information that I can't get anywhere else, but I can get from you. That's what I need from you. Um, and so learning that and listening exactly to your point to your customer, whoever your customer is, um, is incredibly important in terms of making sure that they're buying the product that you're selling, right? If that's your clients, your actual clients buying your product, if that's your boss buying the product that is you, if that's a person sitting across the table from you, right? Even if it's literally your your boyfriend or girlfriend that you're going on a date on, right? Being conscious of like, how do you communicate to them? It's not how you think, it's how do you want them to think, right? And what, what's going to make them respond, so. I, I feel like a lot of people, and it's actually a good example you used at the end there, where if you're on a date, you're thinking, okay, I want to sound courteous, so I'm going to look like I'm listening. However, what you're saying is in all of these circumstances, whether it be on that day, whether it be talking to your boss or a client, it's not about showing your interest, but rather about the efficiency of the communication and actually getting across what's needed to get across. Mm -hmm. So it's mutually beneficial for both parties. Yeah. And more importantly, it's not that the information that needs to be get across, it's what is the, say, what is the information they want to hear is the wrong way to say it. It's framing exactly to your point, the information in a way that they'll respond to. Yeah. So it can be the same information, just packaged differently. Very, very differently. I mean, literally to your point, this is what we do every single day, as you said. Yeah. We'll recommend the same stock to our institutional individual investors at the same time, but the articles that we write for both of them are night and day different. Yeah. Overall, you've kind of had a lot of good advice about how to communicate as you enter the workforce, how to get your foot in the door, and maybe experiment a little bit. I know you said when you worked at Gillette, you figured out what you don't want to do. And that's just as important as figuring out what you do want to do. So as we wrap up, I just want to see, looking back at all you've accomplished so far, the success that you've garnered, this all comes with a learning curve. And is there one piece of advice, if you go back and find yourself when you're 20 years old, that you would give that would yield the biggest um, return for yourself in terms of uh, life experience in terms of success or however you define wealth for yourself? First off, thank you. I don't know that I've been that successful or that or uh, or that we've we've built balance into something that that magical. But um, I think that if I were going to think about what's one piece of advice that I would give myself um, in terms of how to get to where I've gotten, or more importantly, how to get to the maximum amount of how I define wealth. <sighs> Probably the most important thing is uh, just listen. Um, you know, it's really, really, really easy to think that you know what you want um, and to think that you know how to get there. Um, but asking questions and listening um, and just seeking advice and recommendations from people, again, one, it benefits you, as we, as I talked about earlier, because the fact that everybody always wants to give you advice. But two, early in your career, you don't know how much you don't know. Um, and I think that was one of the biggest things that I had as a benefit. And I was lucky is I, I, I found mentors that were able to guide me. But more important than finding mentors that were able to guide me, was I think it was my willingness to listen that helped me get there. Um, that is, I think, that one of the biggest things that I think about colleagues and friends who I think you know may may or may not be there. Who I think when I look back in terms of what was what helped me get where I am, because I don't know that I'd want to be anywhere other than where I am. So, well, that's great to hear as well. Um, 
that you figured that out. And uh, I think that's everyone's goal at the end of the day is they not necessarily know where you're going to end up, but um, if you take those two steps forward and continue along the pathway where you believe you're making the decisions that are right in your heart, you'll end up in a place that feels pretty right. Um, so thanks again for coming on. This has been episode 25. Um, I hope everyone garners something out of this. I believe it was very helpful. Um, so thanks again, Rob. Sam, thanks again, man. Always great to be with you. Hope you enjoyed that episode. If you like our content, subscribe. The button is below. If you want to see another video, our latest one is right here or another one right here. Two options, two videos. Have a great day.